Okay, good morning once again, and thanks to Bidisha and my colleagues for uh, inviting me to give this talk. This is a slight variation on a talk that I have given a few times before, including on this campus. So, especially some of the local yokels, you've probably heard me uh, say this. And in fact, I tend to spout off about this at all occasions. So, you probably have heard me say that also. And one thing is, this is not a polished subject. Now, I teach certain classes here, of course, in my role as a member of the faculty. And then there are textbooks, there are lesson plans, there are syllabi, there are established conclusions, fixed theories, well-solved and well-posed problems with proper answers. This isn't one of those. This is, in fact, in some senses, a very incomplete or superficial talk. But at the same time, I think I'm trying to ask some questions which I want all of us to think about. We may not have the answers to those questions yet, but it, they, these are, in my view, very important questions, and this is something that we should be thinking about uh, as we go along. And it's very good that I, I see a lot of people here who are not just IT professionals, but also people who have other kinds of relevant background, and that's something that I think uh, will help us all. So, and one other uh, po uh, point of note, I don't know how the NPTEL folks will go with this, but I'm in general very interruptible. So if you have a question, you can stop me right there and ask. And you don't need to wait till the end. So anyway, to start with this, this is the talk. And hi once again, my name is Sri Sharao. And this is once again a topic which I think is quite important. But it's not a finished, polished subject where uh, there can be a complete set of fixed lessons to be learned. It's something where there are very important questions to be asked, and for some of those questions we have answers, for a lot of them we don't. And that is exactly the point. That's why we need to think about these things. Okay, so one of the general issues is why do we even bother with this? What are the social aspects of algorithms and why are they important to us? And then what are the foundations of algorithms, historical and so on? Now this will probably be a repeat to some of you who have studied computer science, but it may be somewhat new to some of you. And then, what is the pragmatic basis of algorithm use? There may be a certain amount of theory, but we also have to think about how they actually work in practice. And then, are there any limitations? Yes, it turns out they are. there are. And then, what about algorithmic bias and culture? Something that my good friend and colleague, uh, Bidisha, just alluded to. And then, some concluding remarks. So, this is the rough agenda to start with. So, the first thing is, why do we have to think about this? And one point to this is that computational systems are everywhere. Uh, thanks to newer technologies, the fact that we are increasingly automating a lot of things that didn't used to get automated before. There are hardly any pure technical systems anymore that don't use some kind of IT in them, right? Because of IoT and may, many other technologies, we don't have pure engineering systems anymore, almost nowhere. And even where there are, they are soon going out and we will have some type of networking coming into them. So computational systems are everywhere and algorithms are used to drive them. And one other important point to note is that what is the big basis, what is the need for AI to become so big all of a sudden? AI has been there as a theoretical discipline for a very long time, since the 1950s, but why is it so big all of a sudden? Have you ever thought of that? One of the big reasons for that is that so many people require services, so many people require IT systems, so many people require IT-enabled services now, that there are not enough people to support all those services physically. Or you cannot really deploy people like uh, uh, telecom center, call center kind of people and deploy enough support staff to deliver all the services you need to all the people who want to use them. That is the big need for there to be AI and so on. And one other important issue is there is this term called scientism which really refers to, I'm a scientist, I think many of us are scientists, we all have a very high regard for science, and I'm not at all suggesting otherwise, but scientism, we must admit, has its limitations. And that refers to the way of thinking where you believe that science or scientific systems are infallible. Where you are willing to take a blind risk, where you're willing to believe good about something simply because it is supposed to be scientific in its basis. And that, I think, is problematic. And I think we all have to agree it is problematic. And that is also because of government policies and corporate policies where science or technologies are advertised as being the cure for all ills. And that is a big problem. Unfortunately, that is happening in our country. It's also happening worldwide. 
And that's actually a case where algorithmic processes don't necessarily help society in the way that they should. And that in, in all means that you have this uh, French expression called plus royaliste que le roi, which means more royal than the king. And the, the English equivalent of this would be more Catholic than the Pope. In all senses, what it means is that in some way, computing systems, algorithms have supplanted human thinking. We are in the process of losing our human dignity and our human nature even. My human judgment is now eclipsed, if not supplanted, by algorithms. And in some sense, that should bother all of us. It affects human rights. It affects our individual sense of who we are as people. It can affect the quality of life and the quality of our society. In general, whenever we have had loss of freedoms, we have been worried about it. As a society throughout history, when people lost their freedoms, when they were uh, told that they no longer had the freedom to do something that they otherwise should have done, they minded it. And so should we. That is the point here. So we should think about that. And a couple of actual examples of this. So this is an actual uh, news article that came out a couple of months ago, a few months ago, where uh, there, this actually happened in our country. So this is an example of a child who, was actually, who actually died of starvation. And of course, that's a great tragedy. What was worse was that this tragedy did not have to happen. Most tragedies don't have to happen, but this one especially didn't have to happen because it was because of IT. So there was a mismatch in some government databases, and because of all this Aadhaar mandate and Digital India and so on, some ration that the family had, was supposed to get could not be delivered, she did not get, and that poor child died. Now, one of the lessons I learned, maybe not that well, back in the day when I was a student, was IT is not pure, Algorithm is not, algorithms are not pure. They are not simply a theoretical abstraction that just sit in some uh, theoretician's mind and don't really, it's not really abstract philosophy in that sense. They have real consequences. There are people who can be helped or badly hurt by them. And this is one concrete example of that. And of course, there are other examples which are uh, possibly uh, suitable in a different context, but this one is especially startling for us because it happened in our country in a way that we probably don't want to see ever happen again. So this is one. And a second example of this, this is actually from the US, uh, also from this year, where uh, in the Houston School District, uh, the public school teachers were being judged, or they are still being judged, by some computing system. Their quality of performance, how well they do as teachers, is now being evaluated by that school district uh, using some proprietary algorithm and some proprietary computing system that no one understands. There is some software, there is some vendor who has supplied that software. That software is actually used to make evaluations, and that those evaluations actually determine which teachers get promoted, which teachers get fired, et cetera, et cetera. They, they, there are actual career uh, consequences to these people based on this. So what happened was the school, the school district was sued, and this is an actual judgment uh, copy from that uh, judgment. There was a summary judgment. This is not quite settled, but this was, this actually, the one level of judgment did happen in May. This actually was, I think, filed in 2015 or 16, and it was litigated late 2016, and uh, the judgment was delivered this May. So uh, the school district was sued by the teachers in that school district saying, look, you cannot do this. If you are actually going to judge us, if you are going to say that we are not good enough or uh, we don't need to be employed here anymore, then you need to tell us how you're judging us. We need to know what those algorithms are, what the metrics are, how they're arrived at. We need to understand if they are fair. And so this is what this is. And uh, it's actually something that is probably going to happen more and more often. And uh, there is some interesting language in this that you can look up also. And I have given a reference to this and some other things at the end. I'll uh, mention that. So anyway, so the, and just for your curiosity, this was essentially set aside by the judge and said, no, this, uh, and he gave the summary judgment where uh, uh, he denied the plaintiff's claims and he essentially set it aside, but it's not quite done yet. Those teachers will probably go on and uh, file an appeal and it will go all the way to the Supreme Court, at which point we can say there's, there'll be some case law on this topic. We are not quite there yet. So this is still going on. This is not, the story is not yet over. Anyway, so this is, these are two examples. An example from our, from our country where even very poor people can be badly hurt. This is an example from a more mature society where people's careers and their performance can be judged by algorithms which we don't fully understand, which are not revealed to us. 
right? So there are many such examples. I just chose two because I didn't, I didn't want to go on and on just on this topic. And then there are some general aspects to this that we have to keep in mind. Those of us who have been trained in computer science, such as myself, we are trained primarily on technical aspects. We don't really understand the social aspects of what we do. We don't really understand the social aspects of, or the consequences of our work. So there is a very well-known title uh, from the 1980s saying if, uh, if writers can't program and programmers can't write, who's writing user documentation? And in fact, if you notice, IT systems these days don't have any user documentation. Your iPhone or whatever phone you use didn't come with a manual, did it? And that's because essentially the IT industry has given up on user documentation. This turns out to be a problem they really cannot solve. And unfortunately, it's not just with user documentation that the problem arises. You have all these, once again, like Bidisha was saying, these socio-technical confluences where people who are trained in one or the other don't really know how to establish the whole thing and don't really know how to ex uh, explain the whole thing. And that's one point of it. The second part is also that you often see algorithms and technologies which are well outside the realm where they were only originally intended for use. And one example of this would be with, uh, I think, smart cars or self-driving cars. There are many examples like that. That's just one of them. Now, a self-driving car, or in fact, it doesn't even have to be self-driving. Take any modern high-end automobile made by Mercedes-Benz or BMW or your favorite uh, uh, maker, whoever that might be. That often has a car area network, CAN, which is nothing but a LAN, which is, of course, something that we all know in a different context very well. But the assumptions that went into designing the LAN in an office setting or in a corporate setting or in an academic setting are very different from what applies inside an automobile. But because it's essentially the same technology, there are certain concerns with privacy. You're not typically concerned about someone inside the LAN hacking the LAN, but you are worried in the case of a car. So someone who has access to the key one time may or may not have access to the whole system or may not be somebody you trust with the whole system all the time, things like that. So there are a lot of such things where Algorithms and technologies are conveniently ported to a different domain without fully understanding the context of that domain and how that actually works. And then, how algorithms should use, that is not a question that people answer based on social norms. They don't really think about what the effect on society will be. They are driven by corporate greed. The chip companies want to advertise how quick their chips are. Some phone company wants to show you how good their phone is. And in all these cases, they're not really thinking about the quality of your life. They're thinking about their bottom line and their profits, which is okay. I mean, we are all, I, I, sense, I, I suppose, in some sense, profit-driven, and we are all self-motivated uh, self in that way. We are all selfish in that way. But nonetheless, that does matter because in many cases, you have evolution in IT systems, which is not quite the way we think it should be. Okay? So some historical notes about this. The first recognizable algorithm for anything was Euclid's algorithm for the GCD of two numbers, which we learned, I think, many years ago. For some of you, I suppose, youngsters, it was much more recently. So this is the historical first algorithm that anyone can identify. And this comes from the gentleman's name, Al-Khwarizmi, Muhammad ibn Usa Al-Khwarizmi, who was a 9th century Persian scholar and mathematician. He also wrote a book uh, which gave rise to the name algebra also, which introduced a word called algebra. And then this um, algebra became the word algebra. So essentially, this gentleman, Al-Khwarizmi, his name gave rise to the word algorithm, and his book title gave rise to the word algebra. Now, that has got to be an influential book. And in fact, Latin works for a very long time would quote this guy as an authority. They would say, Al-Khwarizmi said so. So. Uh, for a very long time, this was a very influential mathematician, and he had a very big influence even in Europe in the Middle Ages because of uh, the quality of his work. So anyway, so this is the historical basis of algorithms. This is where it all came from. And mathematics is in large part algorithmic in the sense that constructive methods in, al in uh, mathematics are inherently procedural, like, for example, bisect an angle. In geometry, they teach us various things where you do certain things, and those are inherently procedural. Procedural is nothing but algorithmic. And that was the tradition in algorithm or in mathematics for a very long time. Until about the uh, early 20th century, that was the tradition in mathematics where everything was procedural. You had a fixed process to find something. And there is a very famous uh, critique by a mathematician called Paul Gordon of a 
uh, young David Hilbert. Hilbert himself was a very famous mathematician in the uh, late uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. And when Hilbert came up with an existence proof where he didn't have an actual process to construct that object, he didn't have a process to find that value, he just showed that such a value existed. So Paul Gordon criticized this saying, this is not mathematics, this is theology. In theology, they argue various abstract things. They don't actually have a way to demonstrate that such an object exists, like reasoning about God. So that was what the critique was about Hilbert's work. And there was also a similar uh, uh, statement made by Kronecker. This was actually made in German. The translation of that is, God made the integers, all else is the work of man. In fact, now this would be uh, made fun of, it, and in fact it is. If you see this in a mathematics book today, it will probably be in a pejorative sense where they actually make fun of Kronecker. But the, at the time, what Kronecker meant was natural numbers and the processes for manipulating them, those are proper. Existence proofs and stuff that you actually just reason about in the abstract, that's not good mathematics. That's not something that we actually can accept. And, but however, once again, since the early 20th century, mathematics is not only procedural, and this is one, once again, a classic example of this. I am really not competent to explain this in great detail, but I will just go over this very briefly with you. Now, Littlewood, this guy, Littlewood, was a friend and colleague of G.H. Uh, Hardy. Hardy being, of course, the Cambridge mathematician who also worked with Ramanujam. Uh, that is a name I think you know. And, uh, there are two functions, we won't go into what they are, P, pi of x and li of x. And as x increases, x being a natural number, pi of x is this value and L, uh, this, this difference also seems to keep increasing, so that li of x is actually larger and larger than pi of x. So the natural conjecture was, even when you have larger and larger values, this keeps increasing, right? So that was the uh, conjecture, that pi of x is always smaller than li of x. Now this seems very natural given that uh, even as you get to very large values, this value keeps on uh, increasing in this way, right? But Littlewood had this great insight which is really uncommon saying that no, this is not always the case. And in fact, these two values keep switching. They keep switching where one is larger than the other for a while, then the other one is larger than this for a while and so on. And this switch happens infinitely often. That was a fantastic result. Now, the, the problem is we get to such large values and we haven't seen a switch and in fact, this is actually getting bigger and bigger. So when does the first switch happen? And that happens at a number called the skews number, which is 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 34. This is obviously much bigger than the list of any number of things you can have in the universe, the protons, neutrons, and so on. So this is the time of the first switch. If you get this far, then there will be a switch where Li of x suddenly becomes smaller than pi of x. And then after that, there will be an infinite number of switches beyond that. Now, this is not something you can establish constructively. And in fact, to this date, we don't know, as far as I know, the first value at which the switch actually occurs, this is actually the bound, skews number. So this is an example of an existence proof where in mathematics we know that something happens, but we don't know the precise value at which it happens, right? So there is no algorithm for doing this, but Littlewood came up with this result which said it does happen. I don't know where it happens, but it happens. Right? So mathematics has moved away from the algorithmic aspect, not completely, but uh, mathematicians today don't really consider themselves as uh, doing the kind of thing that Paul Gordon would approve of. So there is a lot more of this kind of stuff happening in modern mathematics. Okay, so theoretical foundations, once again, those of you who are CS people don't need this too much, but I'll just go over this briefly. A Turing machine, once again, which is an eponymous machine named after Alan Turing, it's a model of a computing machine where it, it manipulates certain symbols according to some rules. It has the basic properties of a computer, input, output, storage. And there are different models of computation beside Turing machines, but all of them so far are equivalent to Turing machines. No one has come up with a model that is different from a Turing machine. So it, they all have the same expressive power. They're all quote unquote Turing equivalent. And the Church Turing thesis says that effective computability is the same as being computable on a Turing machine, right? So in general, in theoretical computer science, which is the domain that I came from, or that I do come from, an algorithm is exactly what you can do on a Turing machine. This is important to note. Because we have all these fantastic claims or counterclaims or whatever about AI or this or that, but as far as theoretical CS is concerned, what does computability mean? It means exactly what a Turing machine can do. Nothing more, nothing less. 
And every algorithm is therefore is, is essentially a function from the set of natural numbers to the set of natural numbers. It's a computable function from n to n. That's what this is. So therefore, there are certain things algorithms cannot do. One easy example is computing over the real numbers, because computable functions are only from natural numbers to natural numbers. And similarly, there are certain logical operators that you and I use in our daily lives, like however and nevertheless. There is no algorithm that can actually capture them. Similarly, the set of all functions from n to n is a strictly larger infinity than the set of all computable functions. That's a very easy result to show uh, if you're interested. So there are uncomputable functions. We can actually come up with examples of them. Therefore, in the abstract, even in the abstract realm, we know that algorithms don't actually capture everything. There are things which we cannot do using algorithms. And to move on to more pragmatic aspects, strong AI is the view that human level cognition is algorithmically possible. So there are uh, some scholars who claim this, Daniel C. Dennett and so on. They try to give a physicalist interpretation of the mind they actually say or think, they propose that human minds, human brains are nothing but Turing machines, maybe with a very different physical architecture, but that's what they are. And anything that a human being can do, a machine can hypothetically do. So there is nothing really special about you as a person. Yes? Sir, uh, could you explain how an algorithm works functionally as, I mean, for instance, we give an input, and then the algorithm processes it, what is the output? I mean, I have not been able to process that so far. I may be missing your question to some extent, but can you clarify exactly what the... Uh, I mean, how is the structure of an algorithm? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not an engineer, I mean, so uh, if you could explain that. Okay. I mean, you also made a difference, a distinction between pure computing and algorithm. So, uh, at, the, at the very beginning. Uh, so, if you could clarify these two things. Suppose I have... Uh, let's take a very small example of something I need to do. So for example, if I have a list of numbers, right? So if I have three, six, eight, uh, I need to find the least of these values. That's a classical, it's not even sorting, just to find the least value in, a, in an array. How would you do that? So the way that classically algorithms proceed, or the way that computer scientists have for the last 70 years processed this is, they think about, OK, if I'm a human being and I do this, how do I do it? Can I come up with a step-by-step -step process? Now, once again, the uh, one classic example of this is, we all know how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? Can you describe how to do it to someone who has never done it before? And more precisely, can you describe how to do it to a robot? And it turns out that yes, you can, but it's a very intricate process because a lot of implicit knowledge that I have has to now be put forward. It has to be really uh, described in great detail. Now, of course, there are certain programming language concepts and so on that I'm not going to get into, data structures and so on. So basically, once again, if I need to find the least value, what do I do? I say, okay, I will set this to be the least value. I will have a value that I say, call the least. And then I will go step by step. And then if I see the next value as being less than this, I switch. So I set that to be the least. And I keep going all the way to the end. And whatever I'm left with as the value in least is the least value in that array, right? That is an example of an algorithm where this is your input. And then this at the end should be the output. Once again, missing a lot of important details, right? So, the, the, and if you look at, or if you have, uh, I don't know how common this is in India, but you have uh, IKEA furniture, some assembly required, where you have a furniture that comes to you not this way, but it comes to you with parts that you need to assemble. And then there are some instructions on how to assemble them. You need to put this screw there, and you need to do this, and use this tool, and that, and so on. That is also an algorithm in a very different context. Essentially, a well-developed, well-described process for doing something where you start with an input and get a well-defined output, that's an algorithm, right? <clears throat> anyway, so coming back to all this, the strong AI is the view that human-level cognition is algorithmically possible. This is not really a scientific fact. It's a theory. It's a kind of school of philosophy, if you want to call it that. 
and that it's also a view that the human mind is algorithmic in nature. So anything you call as being your own thoughts, your own emotions, your way of thinking, your way of processing something, all that is ultimately algorithmic. And this unfortunately is somewhat philosophically controversial. The mind-brain identity thesis is not completely free of controversy. There are people who agree with it, some people who disagree with it, and so on. And then there's a very well-known book and a theory called Singularity by Ray Kurzweil, where uh, this gentleman proposes that you ultimately can get to a point where you can, your mind can actually be downloaded into a machine, and so on. And then you can have eternal life in that way in some sense. You are no longer the physical embodiment in human body, you're actually going to live inside a machine as a program. And then, uh, once we are not going to be discussing all that today, by the way, just mentioning this, uh, because it, it's a re relevant fact in the context of algorithms. It's not the point of this uh, discussion. The computational theory of mind has some ethical implications. For example, human rights, how do they change if you consider that a uh, human being is nothing but a Turing machine? That's something that we can also discuss, which we will not. In terms of the pragmatic basis of algorithms, this is something that uh, we do think about. There is a stored program concept which came about in the 1940s, give or take. John von Neumann, a ma very well-known mathematician, uh, made the observation that at the time, there were computers being used for various special purpose tasks. So you would have different machines, physically uh, different machines, doing different things in different roles. And it was obviously getting too expensive to, to replicate machines for each task that people wanted to do. And for Neumann's insight was the stored program concept where you have a general purpose machine and then you give it the specific instruction you want depending on whatever task you want to do it, want it to do. So that was the st stored program concept where instead of storing only the program or only the data for the program, you also could store the program itself. So you don't have storage just for data, you have programs also being stored. And now, of course, we are very familiar with this concept where the general purpose machine is the so-called hardware and the stored program is the software. And depending on the software that you run, the same machine can do different things. You don't need one uh, laptop to check email, a different one to run Firefox, a third one to do something else, and so on. You have the same machine that can do multiple things. Uh, 